Yeah. And the only apology I have is that Pat Catney would be a couple of minutes late. I haven't had any other apologies. No, Pat's birthday today, so we'll allow him a bit of... Oh, Pat is it? Event. I think oh. it is. I saw someone... I haven't been in touch with him yet, but I saw someone else tweet about it, so I'm slow to the game. It's... All right, OK. Uh, Jim Wells asked me to point out he'll be late, but he will be here. OK. Uh, Jim, is that, have we had any notice that's been received from any member who's delegated authority to other member of the committee to vote under temporary standing? No, Chair. No. OK. okay. Uh, declarations of interest. Any members to make any declarations of interest? Uh, Red pair. Okay. Uh, in regard to my bill. In regard to your bill. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, before I proceed, uh, Pat, is it your birthday? Oh, yeah, sir. Happy birthday to you, Pat. And may you. from I'm sure the committee We're will join me in thanking you and sort of wishing you all the best on your on your on your your happy birthday. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. We are dis discussing discretionary bus passes, otherwise Pat will have to declare an interest. <laughs> <laughs> and and from uh, the Minister of Communities now pension as well. <laughs> <Old age. laughs> okay. I move on to the draft minutes of proceedings of the fourth of November. Draft minutes in the meeting are on uh, page six. Members, are we content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of proceedings? Content. And we're agreed for the minutes we published on the website. Content. Uh, matters are rising. A letter to HM Treasury. A letter on the impact of HM as HM Treasury's decision not to produce an autumn budget has been drafted for consideration at page 15. Do we have any comments? And if we have no comments, are we happy to uh, seek your, I'd like to seek your agreement to prepare and circulate to HM Treasury and other relevant stakeholders? If we are content, content. Okay. Uh, capital to resources transfer. Remind members that following consideration of the original response from the department, the committee agreed to seek a clarification on what the transferred funding was used for and whether there was any prior examples in the last 10 years. The department response is tabled at page three and the original response is tabled at page five. Uh, my, note, my note on that is if they want extra time to reduce the detail, I'm more than delighted to give them a few extra weeks to reduce the detail and bring it to the committee. Are we content? So, Chair, that was under correspondence. The, um, was it? The, uh, no, no, so you've got it, I've got it here under matters arising capital to resources transfer. Sorry, Chair, remember that I'm... You're uber efficient. Sorry. <laughs> 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 right, and if we're happy to note, yes. And then if we can move on to the oral evidence, please. And can we invite Dominic, Gina, Laura and Declan to come in? What's the noise of the we're allowed in the Senate chamber? Oh, oh sorry, two on the All right. Starleaf and two on the Oh, two on Starleaf. All right, OK. Laura, can you hear us? Laura. I can. Yes, I can. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Declan, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear Good. me okay? Excellent. Yep. Brilliant. Thanks very much indeed. Gina, Dominic, welcome. Come on in. Thank you. Uh, the following papers are relevant to this agenda item. The clerk's briefing paper on page 18. Peace, Peace Plus programme update and development on page 21. The departmental response regarding budget exchange scheme state aid and Peace Plus is at page 35. And uh, may, I ask, may I ask Dominic, would you like to make an opening statement, please? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, okay, the first thing I would like to do is introduce myself and just explain who I am. Um, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Dominic McCulloch, and I am currently uh, Head of the European Union Division in the Department of Finance, and I lead the team, the, de the department's role in developing and approving and implementing Peace Plus. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Chair and the Committee for providing both myself and Gina, the Chief Executive of SUPB, with the opportunity to update you on the development of Peace Plus. Uh, and I, I, at, at an early point, I want to acknowledge and thank Gina and her staff for all the work they have completed, the progress development of the programme in the context of the current health crisis. I've been working closely with Gina and her team since March, and certainly the, the, the amount of work they've done and the, the sort of the volume of work they've completed has been very impressive, and I, I want to thank them for that. Uh, just to explain to members that the Department of Finance, through the European Union Division, has member state responsibility 
for the Northern Ireland, Ireland cross-border EU peace and interreg programmes, and it is co-sponsored departmental responsibility with the Department for Public Expenditure and Reform in Dublin for the SEUPB. We also, in conjunction with Deeper, have the financial, the financial governance and accountability oversight role for the SUPB, ensuring they operate within its financial and business planning framework. You will all have received. You also work, are you also the lead department, therefore, for all the other departments that may be feeding into the? We, we would be the lead department, the lead, lead uh, uh, sponsor department for SUPB, and all departments will work to ourselves in, in the work directly with the SUPB. And you already have some kind of memorandum of understanding with other departments that that. That's how that process yeah, that, that would be a long-standing memorandum of understanding, a long-standing long um, uh, uh, arrangements for the Department of Finance to lead with all other uh, departments in the executive. Okay. 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 Hopefully all the members will have received a Peace Plus update paper that outlines the key issues and current position on the development of the programme. And just to make you aware, an update of the programme was provided to the executive at the beginning of August and was shared with all executive departments. A further paper is, uh, is currently with the executive for its consideration, and it's my understanding that all parties have had sight of that paper through the respective departments. So, so the Minister of Finance would have issued that uh, paper through, through all departments, so we, you all, we all should have seen that. Uh, the Minister for Finance also participated in a meeting of the Programme Development Steering Group on the 27th of October. Uh, progress on the development of Peace Plus was also noted at the NSMC sectoral meeting on the 30th of November, and a joint communique was agreed between my minister Conor Murphy and the deeper minister Michael McGrath. Uh, a statement on that NSMC is due to be made to the assembly during week commencing 16th of November, so the statement will be made, made next week. You will also be aware that the NSMC is a formal rule in approval of the final Peace Plus cooperation programme, and that it must be brought to a sectoral meeting for agreement when finalised. As I said before, my, my role at the moment is I'm head of the European Union Division in the Department of Finance, and my goal is to have this important programme approved in early 2021, and I am optimistic that we will meet that target. I intend to keep this committee fully informed and up to date throughout the development of the programme and ahead of the launch of the public consultation that is currently being planned. It is anticipated that Peace Plus will be a fully inclusive pro programme, which will build upon the success of previous peace and interreg programmes. The final size and shape of the programme will be determined by the total funding made available by the UK and the EU. Final funding commitments have to be confirmed, and uh, certainly my team and myself are working closely with uh, uh, Northern Ireland Office on that issue. How would you describe those discussions? Because we've heard the Minister say on several occasions, because we've asked him what the likely quantum is, and he hasn't been able to give that because he hasn't had much response from either the NIO or from the Treasury. Well, that position hasn't changed. Uh, at the minute, we are working on confirmed funding commitments from the EU and the UK. Uh, they may well change depending on negotiations between the, the EU, EU and the UK. And, and we are certainly keeping uh, very close uh, links in those with our contacts in the Northern Ireland office. In the interim, Jane and her team in SUPB have been engaged directly with stakeholders and departments in drafting proposals based on confirmed funding to date, with the provisio made for, for any additional financial uh, contributions. Ultimately, approval for, or sorry, approval for the programme will be required from the Northern Ireland Executive, the Irish Government, the NSMC and the European Commission, and we in the DOF will be working to secure those approvals. I would expect members to have a number of questions to raise, both on the programme development, as per the paper provided, and the annex outlining potential themes, content and delivery. Uh, Gina and I are happy to discuss all the key area issues in the paper and how they have been progressed to date. Okay, many thanks. Um, I am happy to take questions or pass over. Yeah, just, a, just a couple of ones. Um, one, because obviously come the, first of, come the 1st of January we have a new relationship. Of course, one of the issues is what is the role of the special and the joint committee. And if you look at the protocol and the issues around the protocol, one of the issues we do talk about is how sort of the um, um, SEUBB funding and sort of the peace funding is looked at, yeah. and the rest of it. Have you bottomed out that relationship yet, or do you re work out how that, that is going to work? Is, is that going to be part of your reporting process to the special committee, to the joint committee, or is anything being anything being worked out yet? It's not my understanding that we will be report, reporting directly to the joint committee. Gina, as the NSMC chief executive, reports to the NSMC, mm -hmm. you know, as a north south north south body. So that, I don't see that arrangement changing 
um, at, at any time. You know, uh, we, we are working at DOF with um, uh, the UK officials to um, contribute to a financial ag agreement that has been put in place between the EU and the UK to, to um, allow for the appropriate governance structures to be in place to allow SUPB to, to function in the way they function now when the new programme comes on stream uh, early next year. And I think it's safe to say that we're still trying to work out what their relationship will be with the NIO and uh, how that's going to work itself out next week and next year. Uh, well, yes, uh, NIO took over the UK lead department role uh, in sort of the early part of the summer, and uh, certainly I've been working directly with the NIO to establish a relationship and ensure that we both work in sort of jointly to get the programme in place as smoothly as we possibly can. Yeah. And sort of under your, I think when you're a very good paper, thank you very much indeed, the funding available and finance arrangement, when you say the total programme value is approximately 650 million euros. That's right, yeah. And uh, the EU has confirmed its commitment to the programme at 120 million euros. Yeah. Uh, our government has uh, rated a commitment up to 300 million pounds, yeah. which uh, for the sake of accounting issues will, would take us 300 million euros, okay, just yeah. to make it easy. And the Irish government has confirmed uh, another 86 million. So we're a bit short. Where do we think that money's coming from? Well, that, that's why we're in negotiations with the Northern Ireland office. In, in the with withdrawal agreement, the UK and the EU um, committed to maintaining funding proportions as they currently exist. You know, it's the clarification on what those funding proportions are that we're working with the Northern Ireland office with at the moment. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, Five year old leg, you're all very welcome. Uh, just again to uh, on that commitment uh, for the 300 million sterling or euro, yeah. uh, that um, was how much of that was previously committed, uh, and uh, has the British government given any indication of providing any further funding? Well, the 300, 300 million was announced in I think January 2019, and that was that was new money from the UK government. Uh, as I said previously, we are working with the UK officials and Northern Ireland office officials to, to, to clarify what their understanding is on future commitments. You know, and, and I appreciate it, it, it is a very sort of late stage in development of the programme, but uh, until we get clarification, we can't confirm any additional funding above the 650 million, million euros. And are we confident like, that in terms of this commitment, the British government will follow through on that? Um, I, we, we, have, we have worked with the British government to try to clarify what their commitments are, and we'll continue to do that. Um, I, I couldn't say what, what their intentions are at the moment. And just as the Chair had alluded there to uh, the Department of Finance and the NIO, uh, what are the issues that are outstanding that need uh, to be addressed or resolved, say, at the present time? Well, the, the first issue will be the, fund, the funding issue, and the second issue will be uh, agreeing the sort of financial agreement that allows SUPB to function in, in the same way that it functions at the moment. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Sir, Matthew. Thank you both for coming in. Um, when you say a financial agreement that allows SUPB to function as it does at the minute, what does that mean and how is that different from funding? Well, the, the financial agreement will, will look at the structures of SUPB and, and the sort of the, the sort of the, the focus and operational capacity of SUPB and the arrangements of the financial agreement is there to ensure that obviously the UK will not be a member of the, uh, the EU when well, they're not a member of the EU as of the 1st of January this year but there will be a new, a new working arrangement in place um, from the 1st of January next year when the programme will not be starting on the 1st of January it will be later in the year so the purpose of the financial agreement is to ensure that EU rules apply to the way SUPB operate and also that UK Northern Ireland rules are respected. Okay, so that's the interaction with the protocol, or is there there is an interaction with the protocol then? Sorry, Matthew. Is there an interact an, an interaction with the protocol there? There would be a crossover with the protocol. You know, mm -hmm. it would certainly fall under yeah. the, the sort of the banner of protocol issues. But um, uh, it, it is um, it's important that it's clarified yeah. that it is to allow SEUPB to function. It is a separate agreement, particularly for the the peace the peace program. Chair, if I may answer that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really the practical arrangements with a funding programme, such as how it's audited, where the money yeah. comes through, irregularities, how they're handled. It's that type of arrangement with the financing agreement. Uh, and in what forum are those being discussed? Have they been, are they discussed at the Joint Committee? Uh, they're not discussed at the Joint Committee. They're discussed directly between the, the Northern Ireland Office and the European Commission. Right. And then we mm -hmm. work with the Northern Ireland Office to clarify that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So the Northern Ireland Office is directly engaging with not not via either the not via the Joint Committee. That's interesting. Um, mm. Is the 
How does this interact with the new EU seven-year budget cycle? And what, so just explain to me how that, how those mechanics work. Obviously, in, a, in an age when the UK and uh, Republic of Ireland were both EU member states, it was less of an issue. But so is it the fact is it that the EU quotient of spending comes under the relevant interreg heading in an MFF, or I don't want to get into the detail of I think EU budgeting is unbelievably complicated, but just in broad terms, how does that work? Well, I suppose that the starting point of that is uh, Peace, Peace Plus is a special programme. It, it is recognised as a special right. programme, and it's there to allow a programme to be agreed in Northern Ireland that takes the best out of the, peace pro the current Peace programme and the interreg yeah. programme. You know, so, uh, it, it's important that that is clarified, and that's the basis of the financial agreement that it, it will allow that programme to continue. The, the, uh, the multi-annual financial framework is, is agreed on a seven-yearly basis. Uh, it was revised in June or July of this year, yeah. you know, and uh, that framework will, will provide the funding to allow the, the SUP to deliver. It will provide funding for the EU bit of the. Of the yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Um, the, the note that you provided mentions a scoping study um, uh, that. Um, uh, is going to be subject to consultation. Is that um, that consultation has already happened now, or is going to happen? It says there's an initial scoping mm -hmm. study being developed, which is subject to a five-week consultation with. Um, this is sorry, on, uh, sorry, this is on the environmental assessment. Mm -hmm. um, but there is there well, there are two. There's the environmental mm -hmm. assessment consultation, and then inequality. Basically, yes, there's a number of consultations. Have those all happened now? They have happened, yeah. and they're just drawn to conclusion. And right. once they have been concluded, then we will be able to go out. Well, actually, once we know the quantum of the programme. Yeah and that's finalised between the UK and the EU, then we will be able to go to public consultation, which is our second public consultation, and the final one on the content of the programme, so the, which we hope to be later this year. So the, the cons consulting on the programme on, in January 2021, and it sounds like you basically have a draft of that programme ready. Yes. But essentially you're saying that's con consulting on that is basically contingent on there being a deal between the UK and EU. Not that there being a deal, but you need to understand what that deal is? Well, yes, as, as Dominic's explained, there's a confirmed budget for that programme at the minute of 650 million euros. Yeah. And, um, the, but there is discussion ongoing, or there may be between the UK and the EU about raising that. And certainly the EU have offered more money as as the Irish government. Um, so that discussion's ongoing until those conclusions, uh, you know, until that discussion is concluded, then we won't know if we're getting a larger programme or not. But we'd certainly have yeah. the 650 million programme. Those, but those, concept, those offers have happened in the context, not in the context of the headline EU UK trade negotiations, but in in where in joint committee or in or where? In well, it would be in Brussels, it's just between the UK Perm Rep and the EU, so that would be handled there. But it sounds like these are. But if they're not part of a for, either the formal UK EU trade talks or the joint committee, they're just happening in conversations or in. Uh, I would say it's probably formally part of the withdrawal agreement discussions. Right. So. Does, is there, and is the offer from the, either the offer from the EU or the, or the? It, it sounds like the inc basically increased funding for this is now in the middle of the UK EU talks, and it's being used as a as a potential um, uh, as a potential move. Not it's not, not going to be a move in the broader trade talks, but that it's contingent to. Progress, contingent on progress and the couldn't, I couldn't possibly answer that right. That's between the EU and the UK. Right. Okay. okay. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, so is six fifty million a total cost to various public purses? Yes, the six hundred and fifty million um, is the EU contribution, the UK contribution, the Irish government contribution in terms of the ERDF element, but also the um, match funding from the government departments that is always part of these EU programmes. Just, just remind us, match funding is still 25 per cent? It's at the minute, it could be, it's, it's very in between, the regulations aren't finalised, it's either going to be 20 per cent or 30 per cent, but right. it's likely to be 20 per cent. And so on Interreg, is it still 50 50? <coughs> Sorry? On Interreg, what's the match funding? Oh, no, it's still the same. It's, it will be the same amount. The same. At twenty percent. So the six hundred and fifty million includes the match funding. Yes. 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 So approximately of that six hundred and fifty, one hundred and fifty million or thereabouts has to come out of our finite Dell allocations. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there will there will be a cost to the Northern. There's no exception. such thing as free money. No, there isn't. So it's 150 million of money that might otherwise be available for hospitals or schools has to go to match fund uh, SEUBP programs. Well, it's to match fund the Peace Plus programme. Yeah. Yes, which yeah. are run by yeah. SEUP. Yeah. 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 How much does SEUPB itself cost in administration? Well, we have quite a small administration budget. It's about two million, um, but the, there are uh, administration elements within each programme as well yes. in relation to... So those. just tell me what percentage of the 650 million is likely to go on administration? Well, currently the regulations state that 6% of the programme goes on the technical assistance, which is the administration, although that's not used just solely by SUPB. That will be used for um, appraisal work, pre-development support for the programmes that we're looking at, consultations, um, you know, uh, studies, research. So it's not it's not money that just comes in. And when there's an overspend on administration, what happens? We don't have an overspend on administration. There's never been an overspend? We don't overspend on administration. There's never been an overspend? I'd like to correct you. When I was an MEP, there certainly were instances of overspend on, on peace programmes. Oh, sorry, you're talking about the peace programme. That's yes. different from SEPB. We always try to overspend. It's a, it's a management tool for programmes that we try to overcommit them so that they will actually bring in the final amount of expenditure because projects tend to um, spend less than what they're allocated. And what you don't want to do is end up at the end of the programme handing money back because it hasn't been spent. So it's a recognised management tool that we've been using for 20 years where you overcommit the programme and so you kind of overspend it, but on the basis that you'll bring it down to 100% at the end of the programme. Yes. Well, let me go back then in case there's any misunderstanding. The administration costs of the whole programme, quite apart from SEUVP mm -hmm. uh, costs, mm -hmm. Are you still saying they're 6%? They're currently 6%, yes. 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 Where, where can the money be spent? Sorry? Where can the money be spent? The money, well, it's spent on the programme. It has to be spent on yes. programme. Where can activity. the programmes operate? It's, uh, it's under the term technical assistance, and that's used for... No, no, I've moved on from administration. Geographically... Where oh, can sorry, peace funding be spent? Yes, Northern Ireland and the six border counties currently yes. uh, in Ireland, yes. That's so where the programme area is. This is a programme which is funding projects both in Northern Ireland and in six southern counties. Yes. But the Irish government is only putting in £86 million. No, the way it works is that the Irish government put in their share of their ERDF and their match funding, so their government departments will also match fund. The element that's coming directly from the EU in this, in this Peace Plus programme is over and above the Irish contribution for ERDF, so that's £60 million in, in addition to that. They've offered now to increase that, as have the Irish have offered to increase their element. How much but, are they increasing by? The EU has doubled their um, offer, which they've taken it to 120, and the Irish government is uh, increasing it to 87 from 60. From 60? Yeah. But they still, the residents or groups more likely in those six southern counties stand to benefit proportionally quite handsomely from the totality of the fund, yes? Uh, it depends where... Pretty good investment. Is. But you could argue the opposite. Could uh, you? Yeah, you could argue the opposite. The United Kingdom puts in £300 million, mm -hmm. uh, The Irish government puts in £86 million, and it's spent both north and south. And the EU's put... Uh, How could you argue it the other way? Because it depends where the projects are being funded, yeah. and the majority of the projects and the funding goes, and the majority of applications. And uh, there's a lot of the projects, obviously, in the Interreg programme, mm -hmm. The projects are cross-border, sure. so they would involve partners from both sides. Mm -hmm. But the peace programme would be predominantly um, cross-community. There is cross-border elements, of course, as well, yes. but it would be predominantly cross-community. And in terms of cross-community and your quality impact assessment, such as it was, does that show a reach to all communities? 
We haven't carried out equality impact assessments on, the, as the like of you would have remembered from maybe 20 yeah. years ago. Um, we don't do that, but instead what projects, each project has to demonstrate individually their contribution to the cross-community aspect of the programme. But you know that it's... building activity. You know that historically mm -hmm. these programmes had a chill factor which they found difficult to overcome mm -hmm. within the Protestant and Unionist community. Is that still the case? I don't believe so. No, we. But you don't. haven't done any surveying to establish if it is or isn't. Well, we don't. We don't do surveys on uh, participation as such. But certainly, when you look at the range of the projects that we're funding, and, and indeed, if you look at your own constituency, um, you know we've got two new shared spaces projects coming up there, with Bush Mills, the courthouse being refurbished, yes. and the shared education um, facility there in uh, Ballycastle. So, you know, we've been able to reach into those communities and we've done a significant amount of research this year and a scope and study on why groups didn't apply to the programme in the past, because we want to make sure that for Peace Plus, these um, groups will be able to apply and will be able to access the programme and we want to encourage them to access the programme. But you're not going to monitor to see what the outturn is as we, you formerly did, we don't which was always we don't, a very embarrassing outcome. Numbers. And actually, whenever we did our stakeholder um, consultation <coughs> earlier this year, thankfully before COVID, we were able to go out around all the counties, and we went around 16, we had 16 events of over 1,000 people attended, and the very clear message we got from, from those people from in every county was that asking for numbers and to look for quotas of religious participation in projects was not welcome any longer and in particular they found it quite divisive at times and the young people as well we've, we found as you would know a lot of young people projects and that they young people don't want to be asked that question any longer have you a section 75 obligation yes we have yes and we but you couldn't we have produce referred. you couldn't produce any statistics to show how well you're meeting that we have a quality impact assessment done in relation to Peace Plus programme, and we do. Did you complete we don't the, do statistics. Did you do a full quality impact assessment? We've had that looked at uh, for the Peace Plus, so it's you know it's for going into Peace Plus. You just screened it, didn't you? We've screened it, and it well, it's been screened by an expert, and yes, they've, they've said no, that it there's no there's no quality require, impact assessment. It doesn't require a full uh, quality yeah. impact assessment. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Dean. Matthew. Very short one. Thank you. And um, just on the, um, uh, the the thematic areas and descriptions that the uh, that you've sent us, um, they don't actually mention um, EU exit. They don't mention the context that mm. that one part of yeah. on one side of the border the, the, it will be an EU member. And is that was that a deliberate choice? Uh, no, you've got a, you've got a summary of the programme content, and um, we have very detailed theme papers for each of those yeah. six themes. And in relation to Brexit, and indeed also with COVID, we have left an element of flexibility within the programme, particularly in, in theme two, mm -hmm. uh, on delivering economic regeneration and transformation, um, to be able to address some of the practical issues that may arise, either because of Brexit and or COVID, because at this time those issues are unknown. So therefore we have written it in such a way that those um, there, there will be funding there provided within those themes to be able to address that. Thank you. And what, in relation to the specific strands and specific, specifically cross-border projects, mm. where there are um, uh, what work have you done to establish whether EU exit um, will uh, affect your ability to carry out those projects on a cross-border basis? For example, in relation, uh, is there any interaction or any issue around mutual recognition of professional qualifications? Well, we have um, looked at that in the context of our current programmes. Yeah and the projects that are uh, currently funded mm. and are doing very significant work. There aren't any particular issues that are causing those right. projects problems at this time. 
But as, as we've said, that is something that's going to develop. We've left the flexibility within the programme to be able to address those. But in the case, the fact that they're unknown, it's uncertain what those issues may be. But it is there. We had, uh, when we went out with the stakeholder consultation and indeed the surveys that we also received, we received 320 detailed surveys. And Brexit and the challenges of Brexit and what it would do economically and socially in this region did come up very strongly as a challenge. So you are, in a sense, as well as the consultations you've done, your next step is really to wait for uh, the NIO and European Commission to confirm what the global amount will be for 21 to 27. Yes, although there's still a lot of work ongoing uh, you know, in finalising the programme, but we do need to know that quantum before we go out to public consultation. Having said that, we do have a figure on the table at the minute of 650 million. 650. But have you had... So I've been dancing around this a bit, and I should have asked the question more directly. Have you had a steer from, either the, from the NIO when they think they'll be able to give you confirmation on that? Well, we would expect a confirmation fairly soon. I couldn't put a sort of time in that. And certainly, I've been working directly with um, my contact in the NIO to, to 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 stress that it's important that we get movement yeah. in this area. And I know Jane and her team; they've been developing the programme based on the funding as we understand it at the moment. But there is there are sort of um, contingency plans that that, that funding increases, yeah. so it will not be a major um, move to to uh, uh, sort of upscale the programme if significant additional funding becomes available. So you, you, do you budget on a, um, when it comes to this sort of, so from 20, from January onwards, are you Matthew, budget? Is it, we're, we're, you're getting an awful lot of indulgence for a very short question here. But this is my final question. <laughs> do you budget on a calendar or financial year basis? Already. Will this be? So you, do, do, it's calendar. It's calendar, right. Yeah. But you would expect, so if you need to know for 2021, you basically need to know soon to be able to plan for well, by the time the, the programme has to be finalised and the budgets have to be agreed, then it has to um, get approval through the Northern Ireland Executive, the Doyle and the Commission, and that will be early next year. So it's unlikely, as these programmes traditionally, they don't spend much in the first year, okay. but you can make your commitments. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. And, uh, thanks, Dominic, Dean and Laurel Declan for presenting here today. That's uh, encouraging. I mean... I'm taken out of it that there is the, the figure there of the six but fifty, but it can grow. It could possibly be a million pounds. I want to state the, the good work which I've found, which has come out from these um, European and the SEUPP proje projects, the Peace Plus and the money that's there. Um, I want to start at the back and then maybe work forward a little bit. I think the biggest challenge for us is going to be the the um, projects coming forward in order to draw down on the funds. So if we look at your consultation that you had, there was 320. But I also see the consultation received 320 valid responses mm -hmm. to engage. What steps can, can you take to maximise this amount of money and this spend? Mm -hmm. uh, is it drive, driven through the councils, driven by yourselves? Mm -hmm. um, how can we make it more approachable? Mm -hmm. to the groups and the mm -hmm. community groups mm -hmm. yep. uh, to get them to come in and in order to, to draw down on these funds that do make such a difference yeah. uh, to the border regions. And I do have a wee question that I just want to make. I'm from Lagan Valley, yes, just, so I'll be bringing in a wee personal uh, aspect to it. It'll be on the Ulster Canal, do you know, which I do you know as well, yep. mm -hmm. or how we're sitting on that one. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Yeah, well, a couple more, but... Well, I mean, obviously, this programme, the, the themes that we've developed are based on, on evidence. We have a socio-economic profile carried out for Northern Ireland and the border region, which was carried out by departmental economists. Um, we have EU papers in relation to what they would like to see and the frameworks that they have. We have all the stakeholder consultation, but we've also aligned this, and we've worked very closely with the government departments. So we've looked at their priorities and priorities for government, both in Northern Ireland and Ireland. And we have aligned this um, very, very closely to those. But very, it was very fortunately, what we heard at the stakeholder consultation and, and what we received as well from the, the surveys aligned beautifully with the priorities for government. And so the officials, and we met with all the permanent secretaries and the assistant sec gens in Ireland, 
and they ha are really engaged in the programme. They see the benefits of it. The officials, we, we had over 90 officials attend jointly together, talking about what they can do collaboratively together. But more importantly, as you rightly say, the projects on the ground, the stakeholders that we met were very clear that they had the projects and they just needed the money. But we listened to what we, what we heard when we were out there, and certainly accessibility to the programme is a key issue. So you'll notice in theme one, maybe it, it might not have come out so well in the summary papers, but in theme one and also in theme six, um, there are elements there for small projects so that they will have a much more straightforward access into the programme. We're also in theme one, the local councils will, uh, all 17 local authorities will actually be given their allocation of budget to do work with their communities. But we are requesting that the, that, work, that work and those plans are co-designed with the communities, like really with the communities at heart, not a tick box or anything like that, really you know, with the communities, what they need in their local area. So we're actually going to provide some support next year for the councils to be able to do that work. Um, so the pro we, we're very clear that the projects are there. In fact, um, with, the, with the detailed theme papers I referred to earlier, we have indicative actions which are coming from the people out there who want who want this money and see the benefits of it and are really um, really excited about getting these funds and what they can do with it. Okay. Um, I, a small one about Lagan Valley. I, I was yes, I was going to come in, which brings in the the, the I was just wondering about the Ulster Canal or the joint up between the other councils that are along that. Is there any progress or any movement? I see that the Irish government have pledged money, mm -hmm. extra money over and above what's here, but I mean, is there any thinking along that in order to get that one through? I haven't heard that one. No. Well, I think you're referring to the Shared Island. Uh, yes. Yeah, the Shared Island. And that certainly is an Irish government initiative, but it's my understanding it's based very closely on their commitments within the New, de new Deal, a New Decade, New Approach. Mm -hmm. Kind of yeah, things. I'm not 100% sure where the Ulster Canal sits within that, All but right. you know, I, I would be surprised if it would sit within okay. East Plus because of the, the mm -hmm. sort of the cost of developing and sort of an element of that, that program. But it certainly Greenway. hasn't been ruled out. You know. yeah, so we are, we are fronting the Greenway. Yeah, yeah. So and, and on the, the just the, the last one is the latest timeline for this consultation. Does the timeline make it difficult to have the final draft for January uh, on your timeline on it? Well, again, as we said, we have we have a, an indicative uh, value for the programme which we could go and consult on, but that's not the finalised position. Um, until we're told that's finalised, then we can go out to public consultation. But we have the papers, you know, we have everything ready to go, and we are doing some final work now with the departments to make sure that what we've put in as themes and and indicative um, targets and indeed budgets that that they are happy with those and content with what's what's been produced. So I know that with the uh, SC yeah, UPB that there are very strict timelines and yeah. strict management of that money, but sometimes that frightens off the smaller groups. Yes. I mean, are, are you able, or, or can we build capacity into those groups yeah. Yeah. that they feel more confident they can go out? And draw down this and enhance yeah. the areas of which they live. Yeah, as I mentioned, the, some of the small project funding that we're putting right. in in themes one and six, and uh, as I'd mentioned to Mr. Alistair earlier, the, our technical assistance money, which comes throughout the programme, we're going to use that in terms of pre-development support for projects. Will that be for, through the council? Sorry. Uh, no, it'll probably be directly um, okay. out to 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 help um, applicants coming forward, and the the councils will have they'll have their own plans. But we're you know we're very cognizant of the fact that small groups don't have the capacity and therefore we're going to do everything we can to make sure they get access. Thank you. Okay, thank, you. thank you and thank you both for coming in. Um, kind of so kind of along Pat's theme, um, you held in the feedback from December, February there, you had the consultation and there was 21 events. What? How are you going to overcome that? Obviously you can't have events now. Mm. So is it just going to all be online? It will be all online, yeah. But we we have, have experience recently of opening a call in the area in peace program in the area of social innovation capacity building, and that's actually part answer Pat, that's part of building for Peace Plus to try and get communities to um, to, to build skills and, and being able to apply for grants and uh, particularly in the area of social innovation. So we did that online and that was very successful. So we have a plan in place. We're doing the consultation online and having you know videos there for people. Now, to be honest, this consultation isn't going to be as extensive or as in depth as the first one. 
because the first one was where we literally were walking into a room with people and saying, this is what you can have, what would you like? You know, and we had a lot of feedback and we had great, great discussions and we had to take criticism for you know, access to the programme and the likes of that. So, but it was really beneficial. This won't be the same type of event, so we believe we can do it online, okay? Um, and I'm kind of going backwards here, but at that, um, you know, at, the, at those events and the engagement from communities, was it different communities or was it reoccurring? Do you see a theme that others that had already um, gained or got funded before? Uh, there, there were obviously those people yeah. who got funding before, but we saw a lot of new people coming in, which was great, and a lot of new sectors. You know, we had people up in the uh, north coast from farming communities. Um, we had people coming along who, who just were saying, we've seen this advertised and we're coming out to see what this is about. Um, we, we did a, a big marketing campaign for it, so, you know, online, we put it in the papers. It was they were totally public events. Anybody could come along. So it, we did get new people and we got new views, which was really great and really interesting. And because because the Peace Programme and the Interreg Programme are being brought together in Peace Plus, it meant that you had people from environmental backgrounds coming along and also listening to what people were saying about peace uh, and peace building activities and indeed the same with the healthcare. So that's why the programme, as you'll see, uh, the way it's structured, it's not even just in the, the healthcare area which is funded in Interreg, now it will be just not only the physical side of healthcare but also the mental wellbeing and in communities their wellbeing and how they can get engaged um, in, in their local healthcare and uh, services. So. No, that's great. Um, I think that's me. Yeah, that's me. Thank you. Uh, sorry, just through the chair again. Uh, just one quick question. Um, the UK Internal Markets Bill, uh, specifically the provision around state aid, is that likely to cause problems or pose challenges uh, for you? Well, currently we don't have many projects that are funded uh, that would require, you know, state aid clearance. Uh, we don't we don't really get involved in funding projects directly, you know, the SME. So. We've been able to avoid that. Uh, we go through sort of intermediate and we do supports for them rather than funding directly. But state aid is applicable in the current programmes and will be applicable in the future programme, yes. Can I, can I just pick up on that, please? Certainly we, we are aware of the internal market bill. There's elements of, so that will have an impact on, on, the, on the, the state aid position and it's something we're working closely uh, within DOF to ensure that the, the state aid arrangements will allow SUPB to, to function uh, as they do do now. I don't know whether Laura, my colleague, has been working on steady aid and things, so she may want to chip in there. Go ahead, Laura. Um, yeah, DFE currently lead on the Northern Ireland um, response to the Internal Market Bill, of which steady aid is part of it. We have actually been working with um, looking at this um, in, in regards to SEUPB and their role. Um, the PEACE programme, as you know, is an EU programme and will have to comply with all EU regulations, including those in state aid. The internal market bill will create, uh, could create a potential that PEACE Plus will also have to apply the provisions in the bill. There is a potential for a substantial drift in the state aid regimes across the eligible area, and that may add an additional layer of complexity to the programme delivery, um, which could impact on SEPB, SEUPB sorry, and the programme beneficiaries. Um, we have been working with the support of the Department of Solicitor's Office and have also been working to ensure that the bill does not impact the operations of SUPB and its role as a vector for state aid on a cross-border basis um, through the delivery of the, um, the current peace and interreg programmes and the future Peace Plus programme. We're going, as you know, the, the, the internal market bill is currently making its way through the Lords and there is quite a substantial amount of changes to it. So we're not actually sure what the outcome in relation to state aid will be. Um, and then we're not sure about the impact until SIs get led under the state aid regime there, or what the UK state aid regime will be following the EU one. Um, but we are going to um, continue to work with the NIO and the Cabinet Office as the bill continues to progress and it is implemented by the Whitehall Departments to ensure that there's no impact on the body or its programmes. Okay, thanks very much. Today. Have you done much uh, discussions with the, sort of the Scots or the Welsh? Because obviously uh, there will, we will have different circumstances with state aid, because particularly with the sort of the special committee and the joint committee and our inverted commas unique circumstances. But obviously this might have a read across for other for other programmes. Because when we were talking about, I think it's the shared prosperity fund, which is the next large chunk that we're expecting to be able to get some resource from. 
And again, that's something that we want to see sort of a quantum of that, how that's going as well. Have you had much discussions with them? And you know, what, what is the general sense out there? Because I mean, you know, I think none of us expect the internal market spell to look the same as it looks now by the time it's gone through back and forth through the House of Lords. And we've heard a lot about the finance bill or the lack of finance bill, I think was more appropriate. So if you've yeah. got any sort of thoughts on those, I think the committee would welcome those. Um, is it in relation to Sharpest Barley Fund and the state aid, or yeah. is it in relation to Sharpest Barley Fund on its own? Both. Both. Uh, well, the Sharpest Barley Fund will be an internal domestic fund, um, so it will uh, it will have to apply whatever state aid regime comes into play, play with um, the UK whenever they decide what that's going to be. Um, the Sharp Prosperity Fund, we have been in um, discussions at an official level with Wales and Scotland. Um, there, there isn't an awful lot of information on the Sharp Prosperity Fund itself. Um, it is going to be subject to the spending review. Mm -hmm. um, we are all in the same boat. There is a lack, a severe lack of, of, of information coming forward from that. And as you know, Bill Polly did pre present some. Um, evidence to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee on, on the fact that we haven't had any kind of clarification on that. Um, we have been working to ensure that the Northern Ireland views are understood um, in, in um, Ministry of Housing, uh, Housing uh, Council and local government as well as uh, the Treasury um, to ensure that they um, understand the, the situation in Northern Ireland and to ensure that the, they understand that the, the best vector for delivery of the Sharp Prosperity Fund is through the executive. Yeah, okay, thank you. And just for members of the committee, uh, there was a piece of correspondence on page 302, which was a letter from the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee to about the Sharp Prosperity Fund, and I thought it would be appropriate to bring it up at this stage to do that as well. I've, got, I've just got a couple of uh, sort of final questions to go through, and these are just sort of, sort of round up as well. Um, what sort of level of engagement have we had with the uh, Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, now that we've mentioned this, uh, sort of the Eructus Committee and uh, the Committees on Public Finance, Expenditure and Reform on the Eructus Committees of them. Have we had any discussions about how we're going to look at this? Well, I certainly uh, Laura mentioned uh, Bill's engagement with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee last week, and, and I read his evidence, and he was very clear where we stood on, on sort of the main, main issues that concern us, particularly shared prosperity fund and, and lack of information. The Octors, certainly I'm not aware of any, 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 any sort of communications from okay. our end or representations to them. And you said that, um, that your proposals are now, you're, you're about to get to the stage where you're probably getting fairly close to be able to send a final draft to the executive. When would you be able to share those with us so that we could have a look at them before they get there? Well, I suppose I, I said in my opening remarks that it's, it's my intention to keep the committee fully informed on developments in this area. But unfortunately, the, the, the COVID and the, the European Union and everything there, it's very difficult to actually pin down when we can move into a consultation period. We want to do that as quickly as possible. You know, and I, I can assure you that once we've done that, we, are, we will make you aware when we are going to do yeah. that and working with Gina. I think as the team. committee would be delighted to have it. Look, even regular updates on how we're yeah. going to. And look, no progress is... It's just as important to report to the committee as okay. progress, so that we're aware of where, of where, the, where the situation is as well. Uh, I think the other issue we have as well is, obviously, and I think one of the, my teasing out question when you were giving your evidence was the role of the Department of Finance as the uh, premise into Paris of all the sort of committees when we're coming to deal with as well. But that then leaves a role particularly between, for the Assembly and the particularly Assembly committees, because I think it would naturally sit within the Committee for Finance to take the lead in this. And maybe one of the things we might do, and I'll discuss this with the committee after you've given your evidence, is writing to the other committees and saying, look, we'll we'll take this as a we'll take this as a lead, but we'll ask the other committees to take to, to input directly with this if, if 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 we could do that. Okay. So that might ease the sort of the process okay, of um, sort of particularly of accountability and transparency and making sure we've got that as well. Um, Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Dominic, Gina, Laura, and Declan. We didn't get to hear from you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Cheers. Thank thanks. you. Thanks very much. Keep yourself safe. Thanks. Okay. Well yes. done. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. <coughs> okay, team. Uh, just from that, there, if I can have your agreement that uh, we'll write to the other committee chairs, and also I said we'd write to the. 
uh, the other ministers to say, in view of this, uh, in view of the Department of Finance's cross-cutting role in this, we as a committee would take the uh, would would uh, be content to take the lead in the over overview of this, and invite the other committees to uh, liaise directly with us. We are content. Content. Move on to the next issue: uh, raise oral presentation on the fiscal council. Colin, are you? Ah, oh, there you are, Colin. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? I can indeed, Colin. Over to you. Great. Okay. So, um, what I'll do is, like I did before, I'll share my screen and just walk you through this paper. Um, and I will refer to the, uh, the various points of the bill. Um, I just need to get to the right, get to the right part. Uh, Apologies. Yeah. <clears throat> My mouse is misbehaving itself. Right. That's it now. Okay, so um, what we have here is a paper about the roles and remits of independent fiscal institutions. There's a focus on the UK and Ireland in the in the sort of latter part of the paper, but it started off with a a broad summary um, of the framework within which these um, institutions operate, because I think that's particularly important given that uh, we have this proposal for a, a brand new institution in Northern Ireland. Um, so uh, as is my usual sort of approach, I like to start with the definition um, so that we all know exactly what it is we're talking about. Uh, the European Commission's definition there um, is probably as good as anyone's, I think, and uh, it's there on page 39 of your pack. Um, and essentially, that that quotation contains three functions. Um, these are the monitor compliance with the rules, uh, the production of or endorsement of national economic forecasts and to advise on fiscal policy. Now, to play, I suppose, what you might call devil's advocate for a moment. Compliance with fiscal rules, the question is, does Northern Ireland have any fiscal rules? Um, what are they? <laughs> and uh, would the uh, independent fiscal institution have anything to measure compliance with? Um, there's compliance with treasury limits, obviously, and spending limits, but at the moment, the Treasury monitors those quite closely, as, as does the Department of Finance, obviously. Um, and then the National or the Northern Ireland Order Office has a role in that as well, checking that limits haven't been breached. Um, in terms of the production or endorsement of macroeconomic forecasts, again, the executive doesn't doesn't really get hugely involved in economic forecasting at a, at a macro level. You know, uh, there are various different um, things that the Department for Economy does, but but it's not really what you would describe as macroeconomic. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of advising on fiscal policy, obviously the, the executive has power to set rates uh, and a little bit of borrowing power, but other than that, there isn't a great amount of fiscal policy either. So uh, it's spending within limits which are set by other people. So these, these are the, the core roles of what an independent fiscal institution looks at. Um, so the question is, what is the Northern Ireland version of that uh, specifically going to do? I would argue perhaps that there's no point setting up an IFI if you don't have a very clear uh, idea of what its purpose is. Um, so it, it, may be, it may be that um, arguably it will, it will help pave the way for uh, greater fiscal responsibility, more devolution in the future of, of various other powers, but for now, um, I wouldn't say that just introducing a new level of, of sort of financial governance is necessarily going to solve Northern Ireland's um, budgetary problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, that's the sort of introductory part. Just to quickly recap on why we're talking about this. Actually, this goes back to the Fresh Start Agreement. At least that's the first record I've seen of it. Um, Yep. where uh, 2015, November 2015, the UK government welcomes the executive's plans to establish an independent fiscal council for Northern Ireland. So it was, it was mentioned then, 
then reiterated in New Decade, New Approach. Um, when we get to New Decade, New Approach, there is this additional bit um, at the bottom of page 40, which says the Independent Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland will pro provide independent monitoring and reporting on the executive's performance in delivering the programme for government. Now, that's rather different from, uh, I think, possibly uh, what I would have thought as being necessarily the role of an independent fiscal institution, although they do regularly have some sort of performance uh, related um, role. Uh, I suppose the point is there that I've raised in that blue box. It's just, is everybody who's in, who got a stake in this going to be clear what the role of the independent fiscal institution would be in vis-a-vis -vis the audit office? Um, because obviously that has a role in monitoring the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of executive departments. Mm -hmm. um, so if we move on, um, to more sort of, I suppose, concrete terms of, of what may be required of the, the council. Um, at the bottom of page, what is that, 42 of your packs, there's a little box there which sets out the nine categories uh, of principles relating to independent institutions which have been established by the OECD, um, which has a, a large network of such bodies. Um, some of whom we met yesterday uh, it, within RAISE. Um, so within this box, you can see the nine uh, elements, I suppose, that the OECD say uh, are identified as particularly important, that, that, that they're owned locally, that they're independent, seem to be independent, non-partisan, they have sufficient resources, that the relationship with the legislature is set out, they have access to the information they need, all of those things which are underpinned by more detail, which is in the uh, in the annex to the paper. Um, okay, Colin, would you think, um, it, oh, oh, sorry, just to think what it says, relationship with the legislature, because obviously yeah. we haven't seen the proposals of the minister, even though he says he's got them, they're, they're ready to go. Uh, but the relationship with the legislature should obviously be the relationship, particularly with this committee. And... I mean, the Committee for Finance must be the sort of the main link with the um, sort of the, the fiscal must, I would imagine, must be the main link with the Fiscal Council, because how else would you have a relationship with the legislature in an independent and uh, monitoring role unless that was through 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 our committee? Um, well, I suppose it's conceivable that there could be other arrangements, but what would other arrangements be for uh, it, it seems like the finance committee is the obvious place for it, um, but beyond that, it would be down to, and I'll come on to this in a moment, um, whatever uh, it is fixed in legislation uh, that establishes the, the institution, but there needs to be thought obviously given to how that relationship would work, um, and if you bear with me, Chair, I will be coming on to that shortly. Yep, okay. Um, so this next section uh, looks at the different elements, I suppose the key features of, of um, the design of such institutions that I've pulled out from a survey which the OECD conducts fairly regularly of, uh, of the members of its, of its network, um, which uh, was last updated uh, just over a year ago. So they survey various features um, and I've picked out a number of, the, the, I suppose, the, the core ones. Um, starting with the, the legal basis. Now, the vast majority of such institutions have a, a legislative basis. Um, some of them are tied up to the constitution. Um, it seems unlikely that any other basis other than primary legislation is gonna be appropriate for Northern Ireland. I can't see what other basis you, you would set one up on. Um, so just to be aware that that's the, that's the norm. Um, in relation to the institutional model. Now, this is where there's some, some interesting thinking to do, perhaps, for the committee. Um, there are a number, just under a third of these institutions which are set up as legislative budget offices. You have the parliamentary budget officer in Canada, you have the PBO down in Dublin, you have the congressional budget office in states, you have a, a 
Namo in South Korea, for example, which is a big one. Um, these are set up primarily by the legislature, whereas you then have also fiscal councils, which tend to be established more by the executive. Um, and then there's a smaller number which are in some way linked to the audit institution. Uh, there are some, Austria, Finland, Greece, and the Republic of Ireland, which have both of these models. Um, none of them are exactly the same. They all vary a little bit from place to place. Um, let's come on to pick up with your point, uh, Chair, here on the relationship with the legislature. Um, the vast majority of IFEs or IFIs publish their result, their, all their reports online and they publish their methodologies usually online. Um, they send their key reports to the legislature and usually the, uh, the chair or senior officer would attend parliamentary hearings, uh, which is what you were talking about um, earlier on. Um, another possibly important uh, element of that is the role that um, the Parliament may or may not have, or the Assembly in this case, in any appointment or dismissal process of the leadership. Um, I suppose there's, there's, a, there's a model with the Control and Order General where you have to have, a, I think it's a two-thirds majority of the Assembly to, uh, to actually carry a dismissal. Um, so, you know, there, there, are, there are models there that could be, could be thought about, but it was worth highlighting, I think. Um, Another, sorry, another key uh, element moving on from that. Sorry, I should, I should, are there any questions at this point? Uh, I'll keep on going. Keep, on. keep going, yeah, okay, right. Um, so the next key point, I suppose, is about the experience of the leadership. Now this is gonna be an issue for Northern Ireland, I think, um, because uh, it's, it's key to the credibility of the institution that its leadership has significant, uh, sufficient sort of gravitas, reputation, experience for its uh, work and outputs to, to be uh, respected and considered authoritative. Um, now, as you can see from the information in the box there and the, and the chart underneath, um, a considerable number of, of the leaders of these organisations have an academic background. Some of them will have worked in ministries of finances or central banks or possibly both. Some will have come from the private sector and some will have audit experience and some, in some cases they'll have moved across all of those. Um, but uh, an academic background is uh, the, the norm um, in, in most of them. Um, so I think uh, that's an issue for Northern Ireland because going back to what I said right at the start about the remit of what an IFI normally does and the range of powers that the Northern Ireland executive has, for, for uh, an academic of the kind of calibre that we're looking for to find a job appealing, it has to be an interesting enough job, if that point makes sense. Um, I think moving on from that, um, it's sort of linked. The, in the independence of the institution is somehow grounded in the leadership as well. That leadership has to be appointed on the basis of merit. They have to be technically confident. And I think in almost all cases, there's a defined length of term of, of leadership, so you don't have someone who overstays their, their um, uh, appointed time, if you like, and the criteria for or dismissing the leadership are set in such a way that the executive can't just get rid of people if they're unpopular or they don't like what they're saying. Uh, I think that's the, the issue there. Um, and that the leadership has then at least some control over the, the staff that they uh, have working for them. Another issue that I would flag up here that may be important is a separate budget line. That's just under half of the IFIs in the OECD network have a separate budget line. That serves as a transparent protection of the budget of the institution and anyone who can remember back to the Northern Ireland budget process of about 20, it would have been 2010 when I was just starting working here. Both the Assembly Commission and the Audit Office's budgets were unilaterally cut initially by the objective. Um, now they were later then uh, amended but uh, there was there was very nearly a large row about that. So having a separate budget line for that provides some sort of transparent protection for such an institution. Um, so I'm conscious of the time. Um, 
the uh, in terms of sorry staffing so you've got a whole range of different institutions um, if we look at the just in terms of staff uh, which is figure four on page 48 um, obviously the US is a big uh, leader there it has the Congressional Budget Office which has been established for 30 something years more actually um, 230 something staff it's a big outfit it costs opposition policies does all sorts of things uh, it's very sophisticated um, the Dutch and Korean uh, institutions are also large relative uh, to their their um, population certainly um, and then a more normal sort of position where you've maybe got 20 or so staff um, <clears throat> but I think going down to Iceland which is the smallest which actually has no full-time employees so it must be someone who works part-time uh, now the mandate and the functions what what do these things do across the world and as I said there's there's no one model um, but there's a, uh, an analysis of long-term fiscal sustain sustainability, which again, given the devolved nature of the Northern Ireland institutions, is a tricky one because the vast majority of the budget, as, as members will know, chair is set by uh, Westminster, and therefore fiscal sustainability decisions are actually, in many ways, taken out of the hands of the uh, devolved uh, institutions. Uh, I talked about economic forecasting before, um, controlling hiring staff, all, all these things. Policy costing is, a, is something that, uh, the bottom one there, is something that um, is, I think, increasingly popular. Certainly you've got just over a third there, where they have some role in, in assessing whether it's to, from manifestos from the opposition or whether it's from specific members that will work differently in, in different places. Um, so there's a, a variety of different roles there that the, the um, institution may or may not um, carry out. So the question, I suppose, really is, what, what is envisaged for this one? What, what has the minister got in, in his paper that, that's to go to the executive? What, what range of functions do they propose? And on what basis were they decided? Um, I think that's quite a key question. Um, because uh, in some ways, the roles that you decide to leave out could be as, as interesting as the ones you decide to include. Mm -hmm. um, so, quite quickly, you just um, skate through the um, arrangements in the UK and Ireland. The Office for Budget Responsibility, you will have heard of, obviously, um, has, a, has an important role at the UK level, it was established in 2010 um, in legislation as uh, a key feature of these IFIs is they submit themselves to external review as well, and that's often organised by the OECD through the peer network. So they get experts from other countries to come in and say, how are you doing your calculations, how are you measuring this, how are you assessing it, and checking that they're being done well. Um, then in Dublin there's the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, which would be the, the equivalent body to the OBR in the UK. Um, slightly more recent, um, but again, a well-respected uh, organisation um, with, a, with a relatively similar mandate, again, subject to external review. But in uh, Dublin, then, there's also the space occupied by the Arachtus Parliamentary Budget Office, which is also an independent fiscal institution, but maybe takes, on a much larger scale, the role that um, we in the public finance scrutiny unit try to do within raise it's that sort of support of the legislature which the parliamentary budget office would generally do they publish an awful lot of stuff on their website mm -hmm. um and a lot of the work's very good um now i'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about the scottish fiscal commission because uh it operates within the uk framework um it has the role of forecasting devolved Scottish taxes um, and as such it's quite a significant role um, compared to what at the moment would be the role for an equivalent body in Northern Ireland because obviously the, the range of devolved taxes is much smaller here. Um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission was set up as a non-ministerial office so it's, it's independent from the government uh, and it was established as a statutory body uh, for maybe five years ago, four years ago, I think. 
Um, uh, has an annual budget for this current year of 1.9 million. So that's the sort of money that you need to spend for that sort of body uh, in the UK context. Um, now, <clears throat> I mentioned that cost because obviously the funding, and I'll pick this up later, the funding for the Northern Ireland Fiscal Council will need to be agreed who's going to pay for it. Um, I will flag up particularly the, the arrangements in Wales. Wales went through a long process of trying to decide how it was going to do its tax forecasting. Um, the initial approach was to ask the university in Bangor in North Wales to sort of uh, independently check the forecast done by the, the Welsh government. Um, later, uh, then they decided against setting up their own institution and entered into a contract in effect with the OBR. And so uh, at certain points within the year, um, the OBR chairman, Mark Choke, would have got the train down to Cardiff and appeared before the committee there. Given uh, evidence, they would have prepared a specific Welsh income tax report, for example. Um, so uh, they managed for the, the last year, which they have an outstanding for, cost £99,727. Um, and I think Robert Choke made a joke about them sharing, the, splitting the difference on a bottle of wine or something. Um, <clears throat> but the point is that the scale of cost is obviously different. So uh, I, ha I don't know whether the executive has considered such an approach, whether the OBR would do, do something like that here, Colin, whether they have a, given they... the different constitutional position of Northern Ireland from Wales, whether such an approach would be appropriate. Colin, just um, to, just to, Colin, just to, cut, yes, sorry? Just, to, just to cut across there. So are they yeah. formally contracted to OBR to provide that service? So OBR has been brought in to look at the Welsh system and report on it, but as a, as a, you know, their service has been basically contracted in to do that? Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what it was. So the, the, the cost was basically, um, it cost them a little bit more to run their models specifically for Welsh data and so on. Um, and there's obviously more time involved in staff have to analyze it and so on. So, uh, but that's where they, where they got their, their provision of these services. And they, they have a, a broader range of devolved taxes, obviously, than we do here uh, in terms of income tax and uh, stamp duty land tax and a couple of other bits and pieces. Um, so, uh, I think it's of interest, um, if, if nothing else. Um, just to, to move on, if I may, Chair, then just the, uh, the perennial question with things like this is, do they work? Are they any good? Do they help? And it's very, actually probably quite difficult to prove, because how do you prove that uh, an IFI has averted a financial crisis? You, you can't necessarily. It's all, all that have to be done on the, on the counterfactual. But generally speaking, um, I think you can take the fact that there are so many of them and they have proliferated over the last few years, the last 10 years anyway, as, as uh, evidence that people who, who think in this space, if you like, think that they work or there is value in them. So uh, from that point of view, um, it seems like a sensible sort of way to be thinking. Um, uh, so I suppose by concluding, points are, well, I've raised a number of points throughout the, you know, specific questions as, as is the sort of usual style, which obviously um, it, it's up to the committee to pick up on if, if, if you want to uh, at whatever time. Um, the, the range of, of functions because of the way Northern Ireland is set up at the moment and the financial arrangements as they stand, although obviously they could change in the future, is relatively narrow. Um, and therefore, uh, you're looking at rates, which is easy to forecast. You're looking at corporation tax, which at the moment hasn't, uh, hasn't been utilised. It's not been commenced to power. So it exists in legislation, but hasn't been exercised. Um, so that is actually notoriously difficult to forecast. Um, and uh, so it wouldn't be all that appealing to, to uh, somebody to do because one of the things that they would immediately develop a reputation for most likely is for being wrong a lot of the time. 
um, because just because of the nature of the way corporations can can uh, choose to to report their profits um, in different years, for example. Um, so they have it. They have an issue in the south of Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, about concentration of firms that pay corporation tax. There's a small number that pay a large amount. Um, so one of them deciding to change its approach can have a massive impact on the revenues. Uh, one can only assume that a similar situation would apply in Northern Ireland where the, where the, the power to be uh, brought in and used here, um, only perhaps more so. So um, the final question, and I've just finished off on, uh, because it's I haven't heard any discussion of it, and looking through the Minister's statements such as they have been on this, um, I don't ha have any idea who's intended to pay for this. Um, so uh, at some point that decision has to be has to be broached. Um, and with that, Chair, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and um, if there are any, any questions, I would like to answer them. Okay, thanks. Uh Matthew. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, there is a, uh, Colin, just, you, the, is, is it worth drawing a distinction between, you mentioned at the beginning Northern Ireland doesn't have any fiscal rules. Um, there is a bit of a difference though because Northern Ireland is a devolved administration. Yes. It does not, it's not a, there is a qualitative difference between a sovereign government which issues its own debt like the Republic of Ireland or the United Kingdom or the United States and a devolved government. So that that's quite, surely that, that's, that's first of all quite a big distinction. But then the other question I'm going to ask is, can you say a bit more about economic forecasting and which models are, uh, entwine economic forecasting with um, their fiscal reporting? I was just going to ask. So my question is, which of them, uh, which of the models you look at? Entwine their an economic forecasting function with their fiscal or public spending um, um, reporting function. So it looks like, for example, the Scottish Fiscal Commission does fairly clearly. It has it reports on on um, revenue raised in Scotland and what the Scottish government is doing with its money. But it also reports it has a it has an economic forecasting. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose the the, the key uh, issue there is that um, without an economic forecast, it's very difficult to make a fiscal forecast because you don't know, without um, an understanding of where the economy is going, uh, you can't project where your tax receipts will grow or fall, or, um, and therefore the two things can't be easily separated, the two roles can't be easily separated, they're both um, uh, interlinked, if you like. When they generally have that economic forecasting power, is it generally, or is it, if, or is it, are there examples of where it's a, like a permanent team of two, three, four, half a dozen economists who are working, that's their full-time job, or is it sometimes the case that you mentioned Iceland where it seems to be someone's sort of um, a bit of pin money on the side for them, um, yeah. where it's someone, an academic who is contracted on a sort of rolling basis to do a bit of... How, how does that work when it comes to the economic forecasting bit? Is there a... Um, it, it's, a it's a bit of a mixture because not all of the IFIs um, actually produce their own forecasts. The bigger ones do. Um, and the likes of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, they, they produce a forecast. Um, but uh, some, of the, some of the IFIs, and a, um, their role is, is specifically to sort of quality assure the forecasts which are made by the central government. So it, rather than producing an independent forecast, what they do is they look at the assumptions that underpin the government's forecast and assess whether or not they think they are reasonable assumptions or whether they think certain things are being understated or overstated. So it, rather than having to have the capability to do a full forecast themselves, they can just look at the forecasting which is done by the, the likes of the Treasury or um, the, Ministry, the Ministry of Finance. Um, and in a sense, uh, quality assure that work. Okay. okay. Um, and in terms of the, the final question, just to add my final question, I promise on this is on the on the parliamentary um, 
office, but obviously in the south they have kind of a mix. They have a, one, a fiscal advisory yeah. council, but they also have an office that reports to the, to the doll or their office. Um, do you, are there any examples of a devolved uh, legislature, something like our own, where there's a where the legislature has a um, uh, an advisory? There's a it, there's a a part of the um, budget bit to two. Yeah. Uh, so let me just get the the, the, the pay. There, there is there's one. There's one of the one in Australia. Victoria has one. Okay. Um, and uh, <coughs> there's one other. Right. But I, I, I'll put my, oh, it's in Canada. Uh, it's Ontario, I think. Okay. Um, but I, uh, I, I I'll double check that. Sorry, I, I, I can't see it there. And, um, Rather than wait, waste time looking for it, there, there, there's there's two at the moment, as far as I know. Um, apart from the obviously in, in, in Scotland. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, once again, very very useful indeed. But I noticed from your paper that the Office of Budget Responsibility in the UK has got 20 staff, uh, and its job is to scrutinise and make certain there's probity in the public expense, uh, expenditure. But surely that has all gone completely out of the window as a result of coronavirus, where the magic money tree has been harvested, to, harvested to within an inch of its roots, and still the money is constantly being plucked off the wall, as it were. And all of the influence of the Office of Public Respons Budget Responsibility has had absolutely no impact on that. So, so, so how, how does it actually constrain governments who wish to spend money like water, as we're doing at the moment for a very good reason, but we're left with a 2.1 trillion debt, uh, uh, you know, higher than GDP. So, if you have these bodies, how do they actually bring an errant finance minister or chancellor under control? Um, it's the, the, you'll see throughout the paper, um, Chair, that the, the image that I used is of a lighthouse, and that's been chosen by the OECD to represent these IFIs because, in a sense, what they do is they make of Yes, information that otherwise may be hidden. Um, so that, that's the sort of connection uh, there. So it's about transparency and about ensuring that if a government spends more than it said it did, that everybody knows that it spent more than it, it said it did. Whereas before the OBR existed, um, the Treasury essentially was producing its own forecasts and could amend its own forecast before the budget. Yeah. Um, if it needed to, because it wanted to spend more. I mean, that was the that was the undertone. That's why it was taken out of the, the central government and put uh, um, independently. So, in terms of can the OBR stop the UK government from spending? Uh, you the question. The answer is no, it can't. Um, Parliament is um, sovereign, Jim, as we get reminded. Certainly, uh, Parliament authorises spending. <laughs> well, well, we we need more of a, less of a lighthouse and more of an anchor, because at, at reality <laughs> is. <laughs> the, ship of, the ship of expenditure is sailing rapidly out of control. Um, we only paid the World War II debt offs finally after seven years. And there's going to be people in this room who will still be alive when we pay off the debt from the latest uh, huge surge in public expenditure. So at the end of the day, yes, we know we're spending money widely out of control. We're way above uh, you know, GDP. Um, so that's all very interesting that we know that we're heading in the wrong direction. But if an Office of Budget Responsibility can't actually stop that or curtail it, what is it actually achieving? Um, well, uh, I suppose it wasn't... It, it, none of these institutions were designed with a uh, global pandemic in mind. And I suppose, um, from that point of view, I mean, from what I've read of the uh, literature in relation to the fiscal response of government, the, the vast majority of economists think that in the short term, a huge fiscal response such as we've had across Europe and, and other parts of the world is actually the right thing to do. Um, and debt remains cheap. Uh, interest rates are historically low, so borrowing is being undertaken at low levels. The profile of the UK debt is relatively favourable to compared to Greece, if I remember rightly. Um, for example, there's still quite a long period, you know, on the on the, the debt that exists before there has 
your refinancing. So from that point of view, um, what, what do they achieve? Well, one thing that I suppose that they also achieve is um, they provide assurance to outside bodies mm -hmm. that there is uh, appropriate responses taken within the planning and, and execution of expenditure. Um, if we go back to the context for the Storm at the House, uh, Storm at the House Agreement, when this was first mentioned, 2015, that was after the Assembly had passed the budget. Uh, and Mr. Wells, you will remember this, um, and possibly some other members as well, that welfare reform was supposed to be have been brought in, but it hadn't been, and therefore a budget was passed as if it had been brought in and then the Treasury was applying financial penalties. There was at least one round of financial penalties, and I think after that, um, I remember writing a paper before the October monitoring, there was to be another 100 million or something taken out because of the lack of, uh, so I, um, of, of implementation of that policy. So I think from a certain point of view, part of the motivation for this may be um, that there's an assurance at the UK government level that UK, uh, uh, rather sorry, that Northern Ireland is balancing its budget. Um, I can't prove that, but I can infer it from the, some of the information. Okay. okay. Um, Paul? Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Colin. So, uh, if you look at the Scottish model, how many people are employed in the Council in Scotland? In Scotland, yes. Um, well, they have a commission, and then they have a then they have a permanent staff. I don't actually know uh, off the top of my head. I don't know the number. Um, perhaps I should check. But um, it's it's not it, it's not a big organisation. And I'm talking of uh, I've, I've met some of them, maybe six, something like that. It's not it's not a big organisation. Uh, and it seemed to be the case that Wales went down the academic route first of all before they came to a re relationship with the. Uh, uh, Office of Budget Responsibility. So, would it be an yeah. would it be an idea to look at our universities here and the the caliber of uh, financial advisors within that? Some very commonly known, nearly. Um, well, I think if if I were if I were heaven forbid I were in charge of deciding it, um, I I would be looking at all the options. Um, I would be looking at the universities, and not necessarily the universities here, there are other universities around that, that maybe could do it, but I would also be looking maybe to speak to the Welsh, uh, um, maybe committee uh, that undertook the inquiry and maybe gave consideration to these matters about why they decided then that that wasn't the way to go um, after the first year. Were there maybe good reasons for that? Yeah. If they're independent from government, who do they actually who do they actually uh, deliver to? If if they if they deliver to the assembly in the Welsh in the Welsh scenario there, who do they actually report to? The well, in in Wales they report to the, uh, the the equivalent of this committee. The, the I think it's Finance and Constitution Committee. It's called. Um, but, that, but that's where the, the primary relationship would be. Right, okay. And, and would, would going by the Welsh model, would that be paid out of the Assembly Commission or the Government uh, Department of Finance? Um, that, from, I, from memory, because it's, it's, a separate, uh, it's a separate charge. So it's like the... So the, it's treated like, or at least certainly, definitely in Scotland, um, it, it's set up almost like an equivalent body to the Scottish Parliament corporate body, where it's like a non non departmental, public, uh, non governmental body. Um, the Welsh arrangement, actually, um, I'm not clear on, uh, I, but, I, but I, will, I will come back to you on that because. Yeah, sure. um, because it's important, isn't it? Yeah, it strikes me that in the fiscal council, in the in the correct terminology, worldwide definition, it's not really what we're after. We, we have no tax raising or varying powers, I should say. Uh, like Scotland and Wales, they have. We don't. 
Uh, some of us would argue vigorously that we shouldn't. Um, so you would have to. It, it looks like a fiscal council for Northern Ireland will just be an outside body advising the committee, uh, which which might be beneficial to us. But we would probably ask it. We would probably ask it to make sure that there's uniformity across the departments in the Northern Ireland Executive. And then if some member here had an idea that we should do A, B or C and adopt it as a policy, we would probably ask them to go off and explore that. In, in other words, do what you do, Colin, when we ask you to do research for us. Yeah. So, so um, wh wh have, we not enough, have we not enough tools at our disposal already? To, um, to, 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 uh, through the chair, the, it would be rather different for me. I, I'm employed by the Assembly Commission to work to the Assembly. The Fiscal Council, as I understand it, would be set up entirely outside the Assembly and it would be verifying and reporting publicly. Now, it would have a relationship, I think, with the Assembly, but it wouldn't work necessarily for the Assembly in that sense. Um, but it, that depends on what, what is actually proposed, I think. Um, in terms of whether or not the Assembly currently has enough resource, um, uh, you know, there can, can always be poor people looking at these issues, and, um, uh, but whether more, more voices helps uh, make the, the accountability better, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I, so that, that's, well, that's a different issue. Yeah, so if they were to, if they were to report publicly, periodically, maybe on an annual basis or a periodic monthly basis or even mm. round, maybe even align with monitoring rounds. How, how would that feed in? How would that information, that report, feed in to the budget cycle here in Northern Ireland? Um, well, I suppose it depends what it's tasked with doing. Uh, I mean, at the moment, there's no requirement, for example, on the incentive to agree the monitoring allocations that are announced by the finance minister. So, um, fiscal council would could maybe the India monitoring and say, "Well, we you think these should be the priorities." Perhaps I, I, I don't know. That's really a political decision about priorities. That's not really that's not really what a I would have thought a fiscal council would be doing necessarily, although in, in some cases they do. I mean, um, certainly in South Korea, NAMO, that, uh, uh, um, they actually propose lines of government expenditure that should be stopped and just say, well, we think that's uh, not value for money, you should stop spending that. Um, that and uh, whether or not that would be tolerated in Northern Ireland, I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that might be very useful, actually. Uh, yeah. So, so well, what it, what... I don't know. Would it be the would it be the Maybe case that as well. would it be the case that the finance minister would produce the monitoring round results that was agreed by the executive, and would it would you see in the future that the fiscal council would assess that, mm -hmm. and if so, um, would that become would that come before <laughs> the minister would publish it in the assembly mm -hmm. or afterwards? <clears throat> I suppose, I mean, it's, it's quite a, that's quite a detailed question. I suppose the, the, the issue is really, it, the monitoring round rearranges the expenditure that's already been agreed and possibly uh, allocates any additional money that has been um, received since the last monitoring round or, or since the, you know, the budget was first approved. So in fiscal terms, the the impact is it is fairly small. You know they don't they don't massively change the the um, overall expenditure except for this current year, for example, where there have been hundreds of millions of pounds um, announced separately, but they haven't really been done through the, the excuse me the normal monitoring process. They have been done through an additional sort of set of COVID allocations, uh, which is probably right. Okay. Um, so in terms of whether the fiscal council would would sort of approve or otherwise monitoring the allocations. I don't think that. I'm not sure. So, so let me take you back a step. And my last question, Chair. So, do you think that 
a communities minister here would tolerate a fiscal council or advisory group? Uh, would, would the communities minister tolerate her, uh, being told by that council that she should give up or he should give up so many millions of her budget to give to the infrastructure minister? Uh, would any... Um, and is that how it would work? You know, I'm not sure that would be... Uh, not sure whether that would be the role of the of okay. fiscal council to say that should be reallocated. But um, I, in, to, to roll it back to your question, would one minister agree, tolerate an outside body saying that one thing or other has to be done? I can't answer because uh, it would depend perhaps on the individual minister and how they... That would be an ecumenical question, Mr Vice-Chair. That but, would be an ecumenical question. Is that how the dynamic would work? Yeah, yeah. Is that how the dynamic would work? Um, you know, the, the dynamic, the relationship between the Fiscal Council and uh, the Legislature and the Executive and any other bodies would have to be established either by the legislation that set it up or quite possibly between them, um, between, uh, sorry, memoranda of understanding, for example, access to information, those sorts of things tend to be, tend to be set up. Um, or the way that they report or operate and things could be done at maybe a less um, onerous level than, than primary legislation. But in any case, I think the, uh, the at, at that fundamental level about how they, the, the relationship between this outside body and the, the institutions of devolution, how they relate needs to be in legislation and therefore would be subject to the normal legislative processes of debate and so on. Okay. okay. Thank Thanks you. for answering, Paul. Jim? No, not for that. Okay. Yes, uh, seats with parables, just all else been equal. Uh, I would have imagined in the first instance uh, if we had tax raising powers, we might have uh, the need for that fiscal council uh, that would fulfil a role that whereby um, uh, if we had, let's we'll say, uh, a government that was coming forward with a programme for government. And the unique thing uh, about us here is that uh, we have a programme for government is represented or includes all parties, and that the fiscal council in itself, in some way, would be in a position to evaluate that without making a political judgment one way or the other, because that's the responsibility uh, of the political parties within that government to decide how does they allocate their finances one way or the other. But that a fiscal council would inform them uh, of the consequences of any decisions that they might take. Uh, that, in fact, is my sort of image of a fiscal council and its role. Uh, and I would think too that it's very, very important that within that fiscal council you would have academia. You would know something about economics in the very first instance as well too, that are well that will be well informed. I think that it is essential that you have total cooperation then from within government itself and all of its departments and the information that they would provide we'll say to a fiscal council to allow them to uh, uh, produced type of work that is a useful instrument for government to make decisions. But they would have to be totally and absolutely independent, and not a political organisation, a fiscal council in itself. It would be that type of organisation that is there to support not just government, but any other institution within the state as well too, that would benefit from the expertise of a fiscal council. But they don't sit down, and I would never imagine them ever uh, influencing, uh, dictating, uh, or uh, given that type of direction within government. Those are political decisions that have to be taken in a different form altogether. Okay. Thank you very much, Lisa. Okay. Um, just before we go, Sir Colin, thank you very much indeed for your, your hard work and the rest of it. Uh, I just want to get an acknowledgement from the committee here. Uh, yes, first of all, for the very hard work that's been done on, by Colin on this quite sort of complex subject. Um, I think he's raised quite a few questions in the raised paper. I think we should send that on to the department for more detailed analysis, if we are content to do that. Content. And one of the issues I think I would like to see a bit more information about is the role of the OBR within the Welsh administration. I thought that was quite an interesting, basically they've outsourced it, but the OBR is already there. It does a lot of the functions of a fiscal council. and. 
it might be, at least to begin with, it might be a quick and efficient way of getting it up and running. I would like your approval for myself to write to the chairs of our equivalents in the Welsh and the Scottish administration just to get their views on their Welsh's uh, role with the OBR and the Scots' view on the, their own fiscal council, if we would be content to do that. Content? Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Colin, cheers. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if we now move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, item number seven, which is the consideration and approval of the committee report functioning of the Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, James Bill. The committee will consider the final draft report on the function of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. The report has been revised due to a correction in paragraph numbering as included in table, pa table papers at page seven. Uh, inform the members that the session has been recorded by Hansard. And what we have to do is I have to formally put the questions as we go through each section of the report. And if we bring it up so we all have it in front of us. Just in case there are any issues. Okay. Uh, the first item is I uh, refer the members to the title page, committee membership and powers page, table of cont contents page and abbreviation uh, page. Uh, if the con are the committee content with the title page, committee membership and powers page, table of contents page and abbreviation page stand part of the report? Agreed. Okay. Fair members to the executive summary, paragraphs 1 to 7. Is the committee content that the executive summary at paragraphs 1 to 7 stands part of the report? Agreed. 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 Report members to introduction paragraphs 8 to 15. I formally put the question is the committee is content that the introduction at paragraphs 8 to 15 stands part of the report. Yeah. Agreed. Summary of the bill as presented at the committee stage, paragraphs 16 to 31. Are we content? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Summary of consideration, paragraphs 32 to th 338. Yep. <laughs> Are we content? Agreed. Agreed. Committee consideration of other issues, paragraph 339 to 348. Are we content? Okay. Clause by clause scrutiny of the bill, paragraphs 349 to 412. Are we content? Okay. Uh, links to appendices and the list of appendices on page 168. Is the committee content to include the appropriate section of the appropriate minutes relating to the agenda item on the appendices? Okay. Is the committee content with the report that the report on the function of government miscellaneous provisions bill is published and made available to all MLAs? Content. Okay. Is the committee content that an electronic copy of the report is sent to all organisations and individuals who provide evidence to the committee on the bill? Okay. Agreed. Okay. We move on to the next item on the agenda, item number eight, written evidence, land and property services, fraud and other matters. Uh, Team, I would remind you that we're currently in open session, but we have been presented with evidence that is of confidential nature. With your agreement, I would like to go into closed session, just in case there's any issues that we would like to raise at this particular period in time. Are we content? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Amendment to the Building Regulations Northern Ireland 2012 uh, Expert Witnesses. And four members, the following papers are relevant to the agenda. Raised paper on page uh, 171. Response from the Chief Fire and Rescue Officer on page 180. And response from the Health and Safety Executive on page 207. Um, Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service has been provisionally scheduled into the forward work programme for an oral evidence session in relation to the amendment of the building regulations on the 25th of November. Uh, the Department is scheduled to provide oral evidence to the Committee on the Outcomes of Consultation on the 9th of December. I would just like to seek your views on the individuals listed within, within a view to selected witnesses to provide the oral evidence to the Committee via Starleaf. Um, I have had a look at this. The one people I do want to speak to is the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, because having read that and read their response in the consult consultation, in many respects, I would like to listen to Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service first, so I know enough to basically ask any further questions. Does anybody else have any other views? Which page is the list on? Uh, it's uh, in the raised paper. It's in the raised paper. Page 171. Thanks. <clears throat> We had correspondence, had we not, from a company? Yes, we have that. A number of companies. Yeah. Are we calling any of them? I, my, I must admit, my view is I would like to hear from the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service first, and then maybe talk to the company. It was Spanboard or something? Mm -hmm. I, I thought they made a number of quite compelling points I'd like to hear from them. Yeah, I, th I do want to hear from them, but I, I want to be informed enough to ask to understand the questions. Chair, do you have a proposal? Yeah, Chair, they, they have, uh, the companies have, I think, contacted most of us on an individual basis. I haven't got a chance to meet them yet, but I probably will. But yeah, I think as a committee, we should meet with the Fire and Rescue Service, but also maybe the Health and Safety Executive. Uh, I think we need to meet with all the the expertise to the, the health and safety executive have responded to say that they don't have a role in this. Oh, they don't have that a it's role. It's not part of their remit. No. So how did? Excuse me. Can, how do they not that have was, a role? That in was uh, that was considered uh, at a previous committee meeting. Right. Right. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Matthew. One thought, Chair. I'm not averse to hearing from individual companies. We're just saying there are, you know. Individual companies uh, are being also appearing before the Grenfell inquiry yeah. at the minute in London, and there are some of these subjects are the matter of very high-profile uh, discussions. I think for that reason, it's important for us to get, given none of us on the on this committee are experts on building materials or fires. I think we should be worth getting the the the, the basics first yeah. from academics and other people. So if the, health, if the health and safety executive isn't involved, is it is it building control? And if it is, are, is there one collective for Northern Ireland on building control? I don't know. No, 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 I, sorry, sorry. I, 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 of all the things I've come in front of this committee, this is the one that I'm quite nervous of because I don't have sufficient information and I don't believe, this is why I have to think that we as a committee have to be properly informed in this. Because you know, to discover that we're the finance committee, but we're also responsible for some quite complex building regulations and the potentially implications for those. Uh, I think, therefore, um, and I think, first of all, I would like to speak to the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service to find out what we need to know or what we should be knowing. Is there looking at that list? I don't have any particular views on any of them. But is there anybody from that list that we would like to invite as well to come and give us evidence as well? And then we should be in a position to be suitably informed to hear evidence from the companies.
I'm particularly thinking of um, the person who works with the uh, Belfast Council. I'm not mentioning names, just in case here. I think with, that gives us an indication of sort of the practicalities of how we're likely to deal with that. I think he, th that person would be useful as well as the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. Would we be content with that? Yeah. Okay. Make that consider. So that's um, the uh, second from last mm -hmm. name, Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we move on to the next item on the agenda, the Department of Finance Annual Progress Report to a Quality Commission. The following papers are relevant to the agenda. The clerk's briefing paper at page 209. Sorry, sir. I'm sorry to bring you back. I just have moved very quick there. Yeah. You just, you'd asked, did we have people specifically we would like to speak to on that? Yeah. I have two names now. It's Dr. Barbara Lane. Or Professor Luke Brisley to speak to the committee? Has they give evidence in the Greenville inquiry? I mean, is that, that, that was the two names that I've written down before I'd come into it. They're both on that list. Pardon? They're both, They're on, both that. on that list. Yeah, well, that's okay. That's, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I'm, happy, I'm happy with that. Can I just, uh, just when I see that, so there's one, two, three, four, we're picking, Two out of four. Uh, do we need to hear them all? The only thing I'm conscious of is looking at where they're likely to be and what are we going to get sort of additional information from that. And what I would like to see is I would like to I would like to hear from the there's only one per, one person on that list is actually uh, involved in sort of what we saw local planning and building control actually in a city that's germane to us. That's that's why I particularly like to hear from them. But we don't even have anything in writing from any of them. No. So I thought it would be another option to ask them have they any Give contributions them use. The other issue is, and I know it shouldn't be an issue, but uh, when you're commissioning a report from a company named like that mm. on any issue, it could be a considerable it could be of considerable cost. Yeah. So there are cost implications, whereas if we could have it, uh, maybe what we should be doing is finding out, should we then be getting further research? And then at that stage, if we have um, the, that person in the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service come and talk to us, and then we realise we need to get more information, we then might consider sort of getting further, further evidence, particularly written evidence, uh, Chair, I thought the paper was to select expert witnesses. Was that wrong? Second. I thought the, the paper was to select expert witnesses and to agree them. Yeah. That delay the business. So there are a lot of them that are Belfast based, and we do have Zoom. Yeah. So uh, I mean, uh, um, so that's why I had asked for those that had spoken. At the Greenfell inquiry, may I, you know? Yes, I hear what you're saying about okay. the yep. police, but I mean, surely, I think it would be better maybe just to to to, to do that and to agree the expert. Do you want to put a form of proposal? Yeah, I think there. Yes, I think we we should go and and do that and, and bring the the witnesses to us. You can for all four. Sure, that yeah, could be done through teleconferencing yes. at a single evidence session if members yes. are content to take I'm, that I'm, approach. I am, I, am, I, am, I am open to any views. I have no set views in this. All I want to do is make sure we're, as a committee, are appropriately informed. If you're content to go for that approach, and we could, we could, we could go for that. Yeah. Chair, if members are, are content to go for that approach, then we could possibly try and slot them in for the 25th of December uh, in a separate evidence 25th session. Of December? Sorry, the 25th of, of November. Have some Christmas party. <laughs> 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 Do not know Christmas yeah, is cancelled. No. <laughs> 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 okay, so that's, that's, yeah. Sorry, Chair, we could slot them in for the 25th of November yeah, uh, in a separate session to the uh, Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. Yes. And then if members wanted to hear from 
any of the companies okay. uh, that would possibly be the second with a view to the department coming on the 9th. I think the department have already indicated they'll be ready for the okay. committee on the 9th. So okay. can yeah. with that. Yeah. To a very important aspect I must do, I must declare an interest because my son works for one of the companies that would be listed as experts. Now, of course, my son won't be involved and nor am I, but just declare the interest. Okay. Thank you very much. Will the companies know that we're hearing from these other people? Should they be advised that they can listen in if they wish? Um, I think there's nothing to prevent us sort of advising the companies who have written to us to say that we are receiving evidence, and it is an open session and it's open to everybody. I don't think there's, you know, we we believe firmly in openness and transparency in this committee, and I don't think there's any uh, reason not to do that. Yeah. Sure, are members then content to, a, on a similar similar basis, as a single evidence session on the 2nd of December to stop those companies in? Yes, please. Yep. Right, agenda number nine, Department of Finance annual progress report to the Equality Commission. Uh, clerk's briefing papers on page 209, annual progress reports on page 212. Members, have we any points? Sure, I was intrigued by the relationship that the Department has with Stonewall. I just wonder, have they that sort of relationship with any other charity where they pay them money to set their homework, to mark their homework? on these equality issues. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to know how much that is costing the department. It seems to be a very preferential uh, involvement with a single charity. What page is that, Jim? Um, various points on it. Let me find it. It's up page 220. Yeah. Yeah, so that is several pages there. But yeah, two nineteen. I think it starts. I know, particularly for LGBT issues, Stonewall is not only does it do sort of charity work, but it also does a lot of consultancy work. Yeah, and I been, think they've been paid to do this. As I oh yeah, no, but also you get everybody from the Ministry of Defence to everybody else does. Uh, employs them on that sort of basis. So, shall we ask a question about what's the the role of the relationship between? Yeah, but Stonewall is more than that. It's a militant campaigning organisation, yeah. yeah, in a very one-sided way. And for instance, I noticed, uh, has there been any uh, help for Christian groups within the civil service? Are they getting any form yeah. of funding or mentoring? Yeah. And also, what I'd like to know is if there are Christians or others who can't accept. Stonewall's recommendations, are they given any conscience clause to get not to have to implement things they find frankly repugnant? Um, but I think we need to start by finding out a bit more about the relationship between civil service and Stonewall. Because I don't think it's appropriate that any government agency has a relationship with a very militant one sided campaigning group. Uh, just as a just for a matter of disclosure, I'm sort of I'm quite aware of Stonewall's work. I've worked with Stonewall with sort of the Royal Navy and various other places, and you know there are there is a perception that they might be seen as being militant in some places. Yes, they are, but then at a lot of other places they're not. Well, I think to the Mr. and Mrs. Average, they would seem to be obviously in the gay network. They're not as extreme as some, but why are we having any affiliation with that organisation? If they wish to monitor this issue, it could be done internally by by staff within the civil service, rather than paying money to an outside campaigning organisation. And I keep making the point: what support is given for the large number mm. of Christians that work in the civil service? Shall we ask the question then? And thank you for the member for for raising that question. Shall we ask the question of the Department of Finance? What is the relationship with Stonewall? Why have they specifically engaged with Stonewall? And do they have any other uh, charitable arrangements with? Other, do we have any names of any particular any other charities? Parallel yeah. arrangements. Yeah. Parallel arrangements. Okay. Are we content? Yeah. Um, ah. The department has a Section 75 action plan. Um, I, I, I can't see. I've had, for there is no statistics on 
to achieve, for example, increased people with disabilities are planned for roles by percentage or by years? Has the department set figures for this? Um, the NIC has diversity training on page 50, training to deal with customers with a disability. These returns provide no information on progress to date. Uh, could the committee have a detailed breakdown of training undertaken across departments and any customer feedback received to demonstrate progress against actions? Who does that training? Which was one of the things raised just a moment ago. Look, they're, they're not very big. They're not very big things, but you know, they just probably help us fill in things that are missing that we're asked to check on on the written evidence from the department. Okay. Get up. I'll send them to you. All right. Yep. That's fine. Now, if we move on to item number 11, uh, it's chairperson's business. There's no chairperson's business. Item number 12, correspondence, response from the department regarding general registry office letter to church, page 276. Jim. Uh, I'm deeply suspicious as to what's going on here because of the huge length of time it has taken the department to answer our very straight questions that have been going on for months. I read this response with deep concern because we are told that uh, the same-sex regulations were commenced on the 1st of September and had to be led, before, led on the 16th of July, and the letter went out on the 17th of July, which seems uh, incredible haste. What they haven't answered here is why such a fundamental mistake was allowed to happen without someone senior within the GRO checking the letter before it went out. And what we haven't been told is who sent this letter out, at what level? Did the GRO allow this letter to go out? And secondly, was there any system in place to enable such an important and sensitive letter to be checked by someone senior before it went out? Uh, indeed, it was, it was left to the Christian Institute, um, an organisation of which I am a supporter, um, just to be clear, to highlight it that they didn't spot it themselves. It was the Christian Institute who spotted it. So I still think that the the, the basis of this has been buried amongst a whole waffle about the amount of work involved and the number of deaths that had to be registered and coronavirus and all that, but it still doesn't get around the fundamental point. Why was this so hastily written? Who did it? And why was the no need to check such a fundamentally important letter before it went out? And that is not answered in this response, and I think we need to go back again and ask questions and keep at it until we get a proper explanation as to this major issue which caused huge concern in Christian churches throughout the country who do not want anything to do with the conducting of same-sex marriage. And that's 99% of the religious bodies in Northern Ireland that want nothing to do with this. And yet they were given an ultimatum that basically, if they didn't play ball, their centuries-old right to solemnise marriages would be removed. And I'm still unhappy with what I've seen here, and I think we need to go back again. Yeah. Any other views? I mean, I'm happy enough with the response. Sorry, what was that, Philip? Sorry, I'm, I, mean, I, I think we've wrote a number of letters and we've got the response. I mean, I don't see the merit in pursuing it. I mean, if Jim wants to pursue it uh, as an individual MLA, I mean, he's more than entitled to do it, but certainly I'm happy with the response that the committee has got. Yeah. Matthew? I, I agree with what Philip just said. I think the response is fulsome. I, Clearly, Jim has a particular view on this, and he's more than entitled to, and, 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 and that is his, genuinely his perfect right. But uh, unless we have, there are specific new concerns, and other than just I suspect there's more to this, I'm not sure what more we are expecting to get. That doesn't stop any individual member pursuing it uh, as an MLA. That's their right. Well, Matthew, through the chair, I think the two questions I'm asking are reasonable. Who? At what level? Obviously, we don't want the name of the individual, but at what level was this decision taken? And secondly, what systems were in place to have a letter of this magnitude checked before it went out? It went out in 24 hours. That strikes me as there's a system fault within the department or within the GRO that allowed this to happen. Two very valid questions, and we still haven't had the answer to them, in my opinion. Chair, I, I, you, know my, you know my stance on all of this. Uh, I'm all for scrutiny. Uh, if members of this committee raise questions that they want answered, 
and it's or remit to do that through the department, then I would be supportive of any member on any subject. So I support Jim and uh, agree with him that if we still have answers outstanding, we need to get uh, them, them. If we still have questions outstanding, we need to get them answered. Hmm. Yes. Yes, uh, <clears throat> a mistake was made, an apology was given, and I think it should have been accepted as well, too. I think that uh, we just know this letter now is read. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Yeah, sorry, just to right, continue, Jim has talked about checking. I mean, it's saying in the letter for, from the Minister here, I'm s satisfied of the one off nature of this error and that measures have been put in place to further quality assure correspondence on this topic. Which, does, which doesn't answer my two questions. And, and also, then, we would want to know what measures are put in place. So what you've done there, with all due respect, is, is raise the issue, which then asks, the begs the question, what measures exactly? So I'd be happy to add that question to Jim's questions. I think, sir, and one of the things that, as chairman of this committee, I believe that individual members should be given latitude, but also when one or two members on an issue that is of concern raise this issue. I think we as a committee, bearing in mind that there are other issues that other people have felt equally um, equally passionate about. But again, one of the things that it doesn't answer is what are the procedures that have now been put in place to stop this happening again. But rather than this becoming a continuous process of going back and counter back and the rest of it, I would propose that as chairman of the committee, I write to them and say thank you for your response. However, there are some remaining issues that I would like you to uh, report back in the form of correspondence to the committee, and we would like to uh, we would like to be assured of what the processes that you have put in place to prevent this again. And I think at that point, subject to satisfactory answer coming from that, at that point we would uh, allow this to rest if we would be uh, content with that process. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, next item of correspondence, uh, Department regarding digital inclusion on page 285. Any comments? I've asked you to note from the Committee for the Economy to the Minister of Finance regarding Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce, new restrictions, page 292. Members, do we have any comments? And could we ask the Department to, co to copy its response to the Committee for Finance? Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, from the Minister in response to the sole authority of the Budget Act, page 295, uh, the Department states that providing the information in detail requested by the Committee would require an extensive period of work, and the Department simply does not have the resources to do within this within the timescale the Committee has requested. I think I would be quite happy to give the uh, department a further Four two weeks to be able to provide that. And I think that evidence, that information should be at their fingertips, bearing in mind the questions that have been raised by this committee and also within the chamber on issues to do with um, black boxes and sole authority of the Budget Act in the past. And I think that should be readily available. So if you're content, I would write, I will write to the, uh, I will write to the department given them a further two weeks. Chair, yeah, if I come in there, uh, I agree with you 100%. What, what's the point of a finance committee if we can't ask questions around finance? Yeah. It's, it's just, now, if they need time, we'll give them the time, and we'll give them the space to produce the information. <laughs> but what good is a finance committee when we can't ask questions about finance? So, yeah, I support you 100%. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, moving on to the next item of correspondence, uh, from the EU Affairs Manager regarding the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and the Shared Prosperity Fund. We have already covered that item. I briefed you on that when we were having the uh, SSEUB sort of briefing as well. Are we content to note? Yeah. Are we content to note the remaining items of correspondence um, and note the information request to the Department and routine papers circulated on Friday the 6th of November? Just on the Dormant Accounts Fund, uh, this offers an opportunity for groups that do not wish to uh, claim money from or buy for money from the lottery an opportunity to get some form of funding. So um, all I would like to say is could, could we be kept up to date with the, the progress of the, um, the Dormant Dorm Accounts account. Fund? It, it, it's gone on and on. I remember it was Sammy Wilson was finance minister when this was first muted, and that's a long time ago, and it seems to be crawling along 
uh, at a snail's pace, and I know there are organisations out there like churches and Christian charities who would like to avail of it. Chair, perhaps, uh, oh, Matthew. Make a proposal, perhaps since it was dated from when Sammy Wilson was finance minister, perhaps we could suggest that out of the a counter paid the £2 million a year that Sammy Wilson agreed to pay for non-existent transatlantic flights. Oh, let's get the political dig in. Go on. <laughs> I You're you not going... the DUP anymore. You can dig them too. <laughs> I thought you were going to suggest we bring them along. <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only if he's wearing a face mask. Right. Okay. Uh, we move on to item number three, or number 13, forward work programme. I'm dated draft forward work programme for September, December, or, out to the end of the year, so page 325. And the forward work programme is the sched it's scheduled for the committee to receive oral evidence provided by the Royal Institute of uh, Chartered Surveyors and Dilapidation. Uh, I think this still remains. I would like to be informed of this more than anything else. I, I, uh, it's one of the areas that I think we are, as a committee, um, we've been made aware of, and I think it would be useful if we were uh, made. Um, f we were given the full oversight of sort of where the professional body thinks that these issues are. Um, the committee had previously agreed to consider the Westminster Hansard Report and the International Trade Committee Oral Evidence in UK Free Ports, which includes evidence from the Northern Ireland Federation of Small Businesses. This is provisionally scheduled for consideration at next week's meeting. Are we, consent to, are we content to consider the Hansard Report next week? Agreed. As part of the strategic objectives, the committee agreed to invite witnesses to help identify and understand innovative drivers for and barriers to change and improvements in the reform of the Northern Ireland public sector. The committee has previously agreed to schedule oral evidence from the OECD and NIPSA, in consideration of other organisations which may be able to provide the government committee's consideration of further two organisations, Pivotal, which is the Northern Ireland think tank, and the Institute of Government should be in a position to provide detailed evidence to the committee. Uh, do you think are we content for both Pivotal and the Institute of Government uh, to come as witnesses in our public sector reform? Great. Great. And members, are we content for the draft forward, forward work programme for September, December 2020? Mr. Chairman, the, the 18th of November. Now, I was late. Uh, I, don't have, I generally don't be late for these committee meetings, but I had an all party group on cancer, which raised some very important issues. So this may have been covered. The land and property service, which brought in other matters, evidence which we're getting next week. Are, can the other matters include? What was discussed under Chairman's business at the last meeting, the, the, the Mr. McHugh issue, mm -hmm. is, that, is that the other matters that we can raise? Yes. The other matters that we can raise in that issue are anything to do with the sort of the land and, the land and property services, and in particular, sort of the payments. Any specific issues towards Mr. McHugh will not be dealt with because, at the moment, Mr. McHugh, I've, I've reported him to the. Uh, Standards Commissioner, so that is separate, so it wouldn't be appropriate for the committee to be dealing with that specific issue as far as Mr McHugh is concerned. But we could look at the issues within uh, payment. Do that. The payments to constituency office, wind Conti farms, uh, uh, undertakers, to like anaerobic digesters, yeah. to whatever, to the whole, to the whole issue. Okay. Because I think that is that that, that is the that is the Jamaican issue. It is the payments to areas that should not have received payment. And how that has come about, rather than specifics of that as well, and the recovery thereof, and the recovery yeah. thereof. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. One further thing in, in relation to the forward work program: uh, the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service fall within the remit of the Department of Health. Therefore, would members be content if I write to the clerk to the, to the Health Committee to yes, inform the Health Committee that that uh, evidence session is going ahead? Uh, item number fourteen. Any other businesses? Um, we have the information from the EU Affairs Manager concerning a VAT rating for PPE for use to protect from COVID-19, which had been subject to a temporary zero rate effective from the 1st of May until the 31st of October 2020, was circulated to members by email on the 10th of November. Um, I'm not really sure, but I think it's unclear from the information provided that due to different rules of import VAT and goods from GB to Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland cannot benefit from VAT exemption on imported PPE after the 31st of October, while the rest of the UK can, or after the transition period, the UK as a whole cannot benefit from this VAT exemption. Look, I am not a VAT expert, but I would like to uh, I would like to get a bit more research into this and actually ask for clarity, because if we're going to have to start paying VAT on sort of I can't work out the last figure, but close on 
um, several hundred million pounds worth of um, several hundred million pounds worth of PPE. That is a significant uh, expenditure, and we need to be aware of that. Jim, we just raised another issue. How, how retrospective is it? Because that's, yeah, that's some, some health trusts spent the vast bulk of the reserve PPE as soon as the pandemic arrived. So can they claim the VAT back, the back on that? And then, if the issue raises, you've raised becomes uh, uh, germane. Can they claim the VAT back up right up to the deadline? Uh, there's many issues because, as you say, I shudder to think how much we have spent on PPE since March. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm having a <laughs> conversation amongst yourself. Ch <laughs> <Chatting up Gemma. laughs> mm. Don't know what committee you think you're on. <laughs> okay. Do we have uh, just before we go into closed session? Uh, do we have an? Um, okay. A date and time of the next meeting, uh, 18th of November, 1400 in here, Senate Chamber. We're content if we move into closed session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. <laughs>